waste a lot of time just with a lot of disinformation stuff. If you guys actually have more potent uh, need of you know questions being answered and stuff, that uh, if anybody has fire ants that you're in their house, uh, whatever kind of thing, I want to really want to provide um, information to people who need it, um, rather than if you unless you guys want just information and uh, the, you know they're coming, you know kind of thing. Um, does anybody have fire ants that they are, you know, having trouble dealing with at the moment? Friends that do. I don't. I have friends that told me they brought in green waste for this. They just brought it right with them. Okay. All right. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty bad. What does that look like for you? What does pretty bad look like for you? Um. I'm off by Palm Valley, which I think is one of the largest ones on the island. Uh, and then they were kind of slowly coming down the hill. So, uh, yeah, you know, mainly things for sure. They're just like everywhere. And I, I was going to use uh, from the guys who maintain them in Palm Valley. They seem to convey that they prevent on a large scale like that. Um, but I'm still up to hear what you have to say because that was kind of, I was just one. Well, I'll, then I'll, I'll get into it. I think I'm just going to uh, go into it. Yeah, what did you guys over at the UH farm, yeah. uh -huh. yeah, all over all the fruit trees and yeah. compost bins, everywhere. Um, I have a question on the, the yeah. risks of bringing green waste to your property with fire ants. Just, okay, all yeah, right. If you want to address that. All right, well, I'll just kind of like, you know, speak on and cover up all, all of yours. <coughs> Oh, you can't hear me? <laughs> hear okay, I'll scream. It was fine. Thanks, <laughs> All right. So, um, let's just say that um, there's a, right now, the way it is, um, there's the fire ants can be transported in so many ways. Um, there's a lot of nurseries, commercial nurseries that I know of personally that uh, are basically selling um, potted plants with fire ants infestations. I've, I've found them myself. So um, what you guys then, uh, being farmers, need to know is anything that you bring to your property that is agricultural whatsoever should be checked. And how you check it is uh, you take a stick, put peanut butter on it. And put the, you know, basically if you got a, if you got potted plants you're, you're buying, put the peanut butter in the stick, uh, on the stick, um, on the, uh, the potted plant, and wait two hours, or you can wait overnight, but um, what I recommend to everybody, since you're farmers, seriously, is to go to, or you can w go to websites and get a, like a mini um, uh, microscope. Uh, one of the, the, the hydroponic you know, stores here have a mini microscope and it has a little zoom and it's perfect as far as you can really see the details of the fire ant. And um, it has a little light. Um, so I would highly recommend everyone have their own little pocket microscope that actually you can carry around in the field kind of thing. Because uh, you're probably at some point in the future going to have to know how to identify them. Um, how you identify them is when you look at a fire ant from the top looking down, um, what it looks like on its head, it looks like it's got veins right here. Actually, they're ridges. Uh, it's the way that they're, the, the head, the, uh, the cranial is actually constructed. It has really sharp edges, um, like a, but like a mohawk kind of thing. But anyway, uh, very distinct um, uh, ridges, or it looks like, looks like veins inside the head. The other thing is on the collar right here, on the sh uh, shoulder blades, it's a very distinct edge, very chiseled, and it's very dark right here. That's the, that's the easiest way to, 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 to tell. The other, another way is the antenna. If you look at the antenna, there's like, um, at the end of the, the antenna, there's a larger globe, looks like a light bulb, you know, one of those you know, fancy chandelier ones. Um, the largest globe at the very end, at the very tip, um, under that is one section that is a larger, a larger globe, and then it goes down from there. There is another fire ant. There is another ant that is very, very similar to 
uh, the little fire ant. It has the same body structure. It has the same, um, very, very uh, close to the same color, same size. And if you don't really know how to tell with your naked eyes, you know, it looks like a fire ant. Um, it, but it is not. And so the, the microscope is to make sure 100% that this is or is not a fire ant. That's very, very important to just have a 100% uh, identification. Uh, we got them for eighteen dollars. So they're not expensive. Yeah, no, it's cool. Eighteen bucks uh, plus plastic. Um, there's somebody that uh, Ann Cobb's that got one um, for like three dollars from China, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. The um, the both of them are slow, but the fire ant travels in more of a straight lines. You know, they're uh, they. The, the fire ants will single source, which means they will find one food source and then there'll be a line all the way there and all the way back, moving very slow. All the way back. You know. um, the other fire ant does not have those characteristics. Mean, the other ant that looks like it does not have those characteristics. But like I said, the, the easiest thing to do is just look uh, you know, for yourself and tell. What I do is I go out in the field and I have a piece of, just get some scotch tape. And if I see a fire ant or even um, the ones on, the, uh, on a, a stick, um, I will uh, either um, take them off something or uh, from my, the palm of my hand, I'll take the stick and just beat it on the palm of my hand. And so there'll be ants there. I wet my, I wet my uh, index finger and tap it and then put it directly on the tape so it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> so. You can look at it with a microscope and it doesn't go anywhere. So, because if if you just try to you try to follow it with the microscope, it's, just like, it's like oh, stop, stop. So, um, also, if you need to, uh, you can put a little bit of spit in your you know palm of your hand and uh, get it in there, and it'll, it'll drown pretty fast. So it's, it's not gonna, it's going to stop moving. And so then you can look at it easily. But anyway, um, let's see. Uh, so much, so much. Um, more questions, real quick. So I give me another category. Yeah. Did you finish your explanation? Of the, just take that peanut butter, put it on a stick, stick the stick in there. Yeah, yeah. Now what, what I do specifically is with peanut butter, the little fire ant will actually uh, it can't really walk over the uh, the peanut butter because its legs will get stuck in the peanut butter, and so I only put peanut butter on one side. So they can crawl around. There'll be like a whole line of them as if it's a nest kind of thing. They'll just they'll be lined up. And so then I take the stick and I just, like I said, beat it on my, you know, they're not going to sting you. If you guys don't know, uh, the little fire ant is not what we associate uh, generally with a fire ant. They don't swarm all over you and then sting you. They actually only sting you when they are stuck or caught between your skin and something else. And so what normally happens is people will be out in the field, in orchards and, and, or in forests, and uh, they will um, shake or disturb some kind of uh, vegetation. And when that happens, the little fire ants have, cannot really cling to surfaces very well, so it'll fall off. And they'll fall off on their heads or their shoulders. Um, and the fire ant is still walking around, and it'll walk around until it basically gets caught, you know, under your, you know, collar, and it'll keep, uh, walk around. When, when you're moving, uh, basically the uh, the fire ant would get caught between your skin and your t-shirt, and that's when you get stung. So most stings are right here because they'll fall off and walk around. Also. Like I said, you're stinging your skin, so like right here, you know, anywhere. Um, if, if you're not wearing a shirt, then it's right down here because they'll you know, crawl around. Yeah. I've, had, I've had thousands of fire ants all over me, and they have not stung me. It's only when they get stuck. So they're not aggressive in that way. Um, is, is there a way, like, you buy plants so that, like, sticking water or something <coughs> like that? that uh, yes. If, if you put them in, um, say, boiling water, and you know, the whole thing in boiling water, if you, if you can do that, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you <laughs> kill the plants. Yeah. Yeah. Um, depends on, 
I had a friend that uh, does bamboo, and that he puts it in really extremely you know, scorching water, kind of thing. And though, you, you honestly, you just want to make sure. Um, and so he did do testing over and over. Um, the thing is, the reality, what we're looking at is, at this moment, right now, the only real um, way to com uh, combat the fire ant is poison, commercial poisons. They're cheap, effective. There is a, um, a uh, organic, or there are organic uh, pois poisons on the market. They are not as effective. The ones that, you know, that are granules, they're not as effective because we have so much moisture here in the air, even if it doesn't rain, the most of the poison, the granule poisons, will um, will basically be neutralized. The poison itself will be neutralized, and not effective after like uh, you know two days, even if it doesn't rain. So anyway, there's there is a poison that is organic and is a, a, a powder, a white powder, um, and is four hundred dollars a pound. You only use a little bit of it at a time, just a you know, smidgen of a teaspoon kind of thing, and you mix it with peanut butter. But that poison is not going to last very long, you know, like a month or so, maybe a month and a half. After you open it up, it's not going to last very long. And so if you don't actually use it, then you spend $400 on, you know, one pot, you know, that's, you know, so the only thing that is financially accessible and effective are commercial poisons. And, yes. Isn't there fungus size to kill fire ants? Not that, uh, not that I mean, like um, funguses. Not that we know that have been developed yet. I know that Paul Stamets is supposedly working on um, mycelium, you know, things like that, funguses. But there's nothing that we have right now that is, is unless someone finds something different that I know of. There's nothing that we know of that. We can say, okay, this is the answer. This is what we do. This is works. So the research and uh, proven. Uh, so yeah. I do know a guy um, in Kau who has had a lot of success with diatomaceous earth. Yeah. Um, I I have heard uh, such stories, but also um, that I, I'd have to talk to them, you know, personally. Um, I'm not saying that's not going to work. But what I, I guess for me to look at uh, the locations, like you guys are on, or most of you guys are, you guys uh, have farms, which is acres and acres, um, to effectively um, uh, police farms. I, I, the farm that I'm living on is 63 acres, and there's like 17 acres that is solid fire ants. 17 solid acres of fire ants wow. forest, which means they're on the ground, in the ground, they're also up in the canopy of all the trees, and so, um, you know, 100 feet up. So the thing is, that, and that's another thing, is okay, well, the diatomaceous earth may be effective in s certain areas, but once again, the, with the amount of rain that we get outside, the getting the poison to the ant, the ant, I don't know if you guys know, but the, the fire ant, inhabits the entire canopy, the entire forest, from the ground to the top of the canopy, the outer reaches of the canopy, every single branch, every leaf, uh, every square inch. They can uh, reach numbers of 94 million per acre. 94 million per acre, right? Uh, so that's everything. And they don't have to come down to food. Once they get established in a canopy, they stay up there. They don't come back down. So it's like, well, either I get the poison up there to them, or I take the tree down. And that's how we get the poison to them, right? And so, uh, so that's where I live, basically, is uh, the only option that we have, that we know of right now, is bulldozing. Take the tree down so I can get the poison to the ant. What so, kind of poison are you using? I am using Amdro. Amdro, A-M-D-R-O. It's a bait poison. It's basically a composite of just a cornstarch, uh, some kind of cheap vegetable oil like uh, canola or soy or whatever like that, and it has the active ingredient. Um, it's uh, you can buy it at uh, Home Depot. You can buy it at um, uh, that stuff's Walmart. Not organic. Huh? That stuff's not organic. No, it's not organic. No. We're at a natural farming meeting. Yeah. Well, I'm just, I'm just telling you that if if you would like to only discuss organic, then I'm I'm just going to sit down because 
if you guys are wanting solutions, then I can help you. As can you help? As can do. you talk about um, contamination and that? Like, uh, how do we avoid getting them if we don't have them? Okay, prevention. Yeah. Once again, check check everything, everything that comes on your property. Number two is prevention is. Uh, the way you, uh, in which you plant um, your, your orchards. Separate trees and so they do not touch canopies. Uh, fire ants, uh, if, if they um, don't have to come down, then that's a highway. So they're going to go from tree canopy to tree canopy to tree canopy and not even have to come down to the ground to get to every tree in your orchard, basically. So have a separation. Um, I would say keep everything as low as possible. Um, actually, uh, just lava flow is perfect. So think of this, if there's, the, the more food there is, the more nesting sites there is, the more fire ants you're gonna have. And so if you keep everything as low as possible, as least amount of vegetation um, as possible, then there's gonna be less density of population. Eventually, in my opinion, just looking at how the fire ants have been moving, we are all going to have fire ants at some point. Either, either it's going to be five years from now or ten years from now. We're all going to have fire ants around us somehow. So what are the negative effects of fire ants? Uh, well... Besides stinging you. Yeah, well, the thing is they also um, uh, interrupt agriculture. They will actually make nests in flowers. And so there, uh, there are islands in the, uh, in the tropics where basically 80% of the cacao plantations have gone down because of the fire infestation in the flower. Also they, they uh, farm aphids and so basically they got aphids, it's just, it just creates um, uh, uh, a, 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 an uns, uh, unsuitable environment for you know, the, the production of, of fruits. Um, Soursops. I love soursops because the soursops, you know, like the little dangly thing, is, is a perfect little home for them. Yeah, I was um, I was working on this farm and there's a row of uh, taro and sweet potatoes with yeah. papaya trees in it, yeah. and one of the papaya trees had um, half fallen down and was propped back up, yeah. and that that papaya tree had a whole uh, like fire ant colony going up, farming the little white things, yeah. probably aphids, aphids. Yeah. and. Um, and it infested like most of the kalo and sweet potatoes in the ground also. They were farming it in there. After like harvesting most of the taro and replanting and just taking that one tree out, the infestations left on the rest of the papaya trees. It was really just like the weak tree was taken out by the aphids. So it's kind of like another thing in natural farming, like strong plants just should be, you know, stronger than an infestation or well-managed plants. Um, I get that's to be, we will find out because like I said, all of you will have them eventually. Yeah. So basically you're saying, I mean, if there's no, I mean, I, mean, I think there's got to be some like, resolution other than some sort of poison. They just haven't found it yet. Exactly. At the but moment, I mean, if they the don't moment. find it, then yeah. basically you're saying that you're either going to have to chop down all the trees mm -hmm. and no food is going to grow. I mean, it's like, you got to keep their population at bay, but if you're not allowed, if you want lava rock and, and you don't want food growing, yeah. then that's going to keep our population at bay too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just like one or the other. I mean, like if they have to spray it with poison, like would you really have to chop down the tree? I mean, I hate, I I'm not, I don't like the idea of poison, but if it was absolutely necessary, couldn't they just spray it airily? Um. That's like over the canopy. Well, there there are methods um, um, to actually spray trees. Well, you guys don't want, you don't want to talk about poison, so I'm not going to talk about poison. Okay. Um, but I, I will. I'll give you, I'll give you a reality check, though. Where I live is Kapoho, right? And a lot of people, you know, some people here know me very well. I myself uh, started this with um, my own farm having fire ants. I had I. The, at the point in which I found them, I had a solid acre. Solid acre. Okay, they, they can expand um, pretty rapidly. And so that solid acre, uh, uh, if, if 
I did not do anything. That solid acre would be an acre and a half, two acres, three acres. I've seen it with my own eyes with the place I'm at, the 60 acre, 63 acre farm. They can move, uh, I will say, honestly, they can move, uh, what, 60 feet in two weeks. 60 feet in two weeks. And so if they keep moving and keep moving and keep moving 60 feet and 60 feet every two weeks, they can move rapidly and, and basically and then it becomes exponential. So it's like, well, it's, it's, it's a uh, 10 acre in infestation. Then he's like, you know, oh, 10 and a half and then 11. And then because the whole thing is gonna expand, you know. And so basically uh, there's probably like, I would say 10 to 15 farms, organic permaculture farms in my area that Basically, they found that the only method to solve their problem was poison. It sounds atrocious. It sounds atrocious. But the thing is, what happens if you, if you don't do anything, and right now we don't have knowledge, uh, or at least available knowledge, of what to do uh, naturally, organically, um, they will just take, take over your place. And so what happens, and this is, this is what happens, um, I know a personal friend of mine who used to work at a, um, uh, at a, uh, um, a lychee and long gone farm, Pamakua Coast. The workers there that harvest, they basically um, will have long, you know, uh, long uh, pants and they'll tape, duct tape the, uh, their pants to their boots, right? So there's no hands to get in there. They have long sleeves and gloves, they'll duct tape that. And to make sure that the ants go, don't get into their collar, they will duct tape their neck. That's how they go out and harvest long gons and, and lychees. That's the ones that actually do it. There's another one that I know of, uh, this, uh, the bulldozer operator that I know, that he has a long gone lychee farm. His, far, his workers will not go under the trees, period. They will not go under the tree spirit. So what, the, what this is, this is my personal experience and every other person that I've known that works with fire ants, this is what happens, is that you'll be working and you're, you know, being productive and efficient, da 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 da, -da and you get a sting. Oh, that's, that's a sting, it's an irritation, big deal. You keep working. And then you get another one. Oh, you keep working, no big deal. Well, after a certain amount of, I'll say the venom, enters your system, it is no longer an, a little isolated sting. It actually consumes your entire body. And it feels like you stuck your fingers in a light socket. There is an impulse, there's a vibration that runs through your, your entire body that vibrates and you can feel it like an impulse. And when that happens, everybody has their threshold. So far that I know of, everybody has their own threshold. And I don't know if it's five stings or it's 10 or whatever like that. And they can sting multiple times. You drop whatever's in your hands and you start running for water. Either the shower or you jump in a pond or a lake or a water catch tank. That is what I have seen over and over and over again that people have got, their bodies have gotten overwhelmed by, you know, I was supposed to say the venom in their system. Now, people that have had that experience, they choose, even though it gets, goes against everything uh, they stand for, they look at, okay, well, this is my farm. Is, is this my farm or is this not my farm? And what do I do? I've lived here for 15 years. I've planted da 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 da, -da. What am I gonna do? Because, is they're not going to stop at the farm, they're going to get into your house. Uh, like I said, I've been, I've covered residential areas, and to, I've covered people that, uh, this one lady has a, a daughter with Down syndrome, and the fire ants basically are in her walls, they're in the plumbing, they're in, uh, there's, they're everywhere, and they're crawling on the floor, they're in the, the cupboards, they're in, um, uh, the closets, they're in the clothes, they're in the beds, they get stung every single night. She can't, the, 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 the daughter that has Down syndrome, she can't even, she couldn't even just sit on the floor and play because they, she was <coughs> stung just sitting on the floor because they're just crawling out everywhere. Like I said, every square inch of everything and that includes your house. And so once again, people that are diehard organic 
uh, all the way, no poisons, has to be natural, getting stung every single night. There are children getting stung every single night. They say, okay, what can I do? Yes, what, what yeah. is it? How do you use poison? I think what I'll do is, I'll be, uh, I will, um, I'll give out my phone number and talk to people. I'll stay after or uh, whatever when you were doing whatever. I'll talk to people individually. I want to honor and respect what you guys are up. It's my life. You know, I, I have, you guys don't know what I went through to buy a bag of poison to put on my own property. I had owned it for eight years and thinking, okay, I, it just sat in the bag and I just couldn't touch it. But then, I, like I said, I just weighed all the options, weighed all the options. What am I going to do? What, because we're raising kids. We are raising kids in this environment. And what are we going to do with the kids? Because if there are fire ants everywhere, the kids can't go anywhere. Because, oh, you can't go over there, you can't go over there, you can't go over there, you're going to get stung, you're going to get stung, and they're going to get stung. And they're going to be crying and crying and stung. And crying. I mean, so, anyway, yes? Well, I'm just wondering about the trees, like... I mean, if, if the poison is necessary, which, you know, I, sometimes it is. I mean, it's just reality, you know. Um, how can you, can you put it, I mean, do you have to destroy your orchard? Like, are there, is it necessary to destroy your orchard, to destroy your orchard if you have fire ants? Or can you salvage the trees? And, I mean, it sounds terrible, but... Yeah, there, is there, 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 way? there are it's methods good. of applying... Um, <coughs> uh, uh, materials, I would say a poison or even an organic poison, it's at $400 a pound, so it might not be, you know, financially feasible. Yeah. But you but, say it takes a small amount, though? Yeah, but the small amount of a poison, but also, actually, you're going to spend more on peanut butter, <laughs> because it's <laughs> not the poison, but a larger amount of peanut butter, so you're going to spend actually twice as much, four times as much on peanut butter <laughs> as the $400 for a pound of it. Yeah. Actually, you for you to go through that entire pound, you're going to spend, like I said, four times on peanut butter. Um, but there are ways to apply the peanut butter with the infusion of the poison into um, the canopy, like up to like 50 feet or so, with um, with air compressed uh, um, spray. The, the guys, uh, the, uh, the people that apply, um, uh, like. Uh, drive it on the sides of houses, you know, that stuff on the sides of houses, they have like these uh, air compressed uh, spray guns that will shoot it up and it, it's kind of messy because it kind of, but basically that is one, um, one approach. Is peanut butter the only substrate? Well, it, 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 it must be something that is, that is attractive. See, the peanut butter basically what it does is you just, uh, um, infuse the peanut butter with the poison, right? And so something that is attractive to eat that they're going to soak up, they're, but, but what's going to happen is the fire ants are just going to soak up the oils, be attracted to oils in the peanut butter, and then take the oils back. Those oils infused with, with micro you know, amounts of poison, that's how it's distributed. And it's a bait poison as well. That's why the conventional poison has vegetable oil. Uh, yes, because that's the attractant. That has to be something that the fire ant basically sniffs out and says, "Ooh, that's food. I want some of that." And so the, the peanut butter, and also the peanut butter actually sticks to the side of the tree. And so you want the poison to be there, not just fall off. Because you can you can spray Amdro, you know, into the tree, but it's just all going to be this little granules like couscous, and it's just all going to fall down. A lot of it. So you lose it. So you know he's. Yeah. Uh, one that my dogs are lying to again, like in the. Bites and stuff. Okay. It does work. It's good that there's fire about this topic because we need to kind of delegate more time and research into the different methods. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know Paul uh, Drake. I don't know if you he ever mentioned to you about how he's using boric acid and peanut butter and yeah. some other methods. Boric acid. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be good to, you know, let you know to maybe update the website about, you know, some more information we can all find. So so far, this as far as I know, and this this is me talking to uh, the other people I know, including uh, Cass Vanderood, who is like the guy that uh, is at the agri department, and he's pretty well known worldwide about this uh, 
Uh, boric acid is effective, is effective, but it is really also kind of not effective in, in, in a larger scope. Um, as far as I know, once again, as far as I know, I have not seen reports that are, okay, this is, this works, and you just do it, and it, it works, and you can do it in these amounts, and da, 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 and no, hands down, it works. Um, once again, I'm talking about larger applications of like, you know, five acres, you know, kind of thing. Um, effectiveness. Um, like I said, you know, the, the diatomaceous earth, yes, it is effective, but um, if you are, if the thing is, and this is what all of you, and my prediction, um, at some point in the future, are going to basically, your property is going to be surrounded by fire ants. And they are going to come on all four borders 24 hours a day. And what we have to do is figure out, okay, there's fire ants coming 24 hours a day. What can I afford? Because if I got 63 acres, I can't police you know, the borders, like, you know, 3,000 feet by 3,000 feet by 3,000 feet effectively. And so it's like, well, <laughs> that's just like, I can't do it. I cannot do it. And so the fire ants are going to encroach on my property. Uh, I will be limited by my manpower and my finances. And also the technology. Technology. We, I have no idea what's going to come down the pipeline and be available commercially or easily available or accessibly. Uh, in the future, I'm just saying as it is right now, if it continues, um, is that the fire ants are just going to basically come onto our properties and we will define a, a zone, a comfort zone. This is where I do not want the fire ants. I can ma successfully manage this area financially and labor wise. Everything else is going to be fire ants. Yes. Do the fire ants have any natural predators? No. The only thing that uh, the fire ants are from South America and uh, Central America. The only thing that keeps the fire ants in check are other ants, other insects, really. Um, the one detriment that we have, the, the most extreme detriment that we have with this little fire ant here is even in, like in, um, uh, in the South America, um, each colony of little fire ants are going to compete and go to war with each other, right? Um, and so they're going to keep each other in check. What we have here on this island, we have one colony, which means they are all identical, which means they work communally. There's no competition. There's no, there's no inter-colony um, in, uh, inter you know, feuds, right? And so what that looks like is one worker <coughs> can go out in search of food uh, you know, from nest A, get some food, and then that, uh, that worker ant can come back and get caught on another trail, another scent trail, and go to nest B, deposit the food, leave nest B, go out, get more food, get <coughs> on another trail, to nest C. They work communally. There's no competition. And so that's why how they take over is sheer density of population, sheer density, every square inch of everything. Um, one of the one of the things that we have to our, that is a disadvantage here, uh, my, especially in my area, is um, cane grass fields. They love cane grass, or what's also called elephant grass. They love it. Um, it's got so much food. The, the sweets and the resins from the cane grass. Every fold, every fold of, uh, you know, at each node of every leaf, that is a potential nesting site. And so if you think of a whole, you know, cane grass field, there's millions and millions and millions and millions um, that are in there. Uh, just undeveloped properties. The other thing is as far as how they're going to be spread or how they have been um, spread. Uh, undeveloped properties uh, have been um, pretty easy <coughs> accessible for pot growers. I know personally some pot growers that have nurseries, and their nurseries have fire ants. And so when they get big enough, they take them out into the undeveloped whatever um, to have you know out, out the gorilla planting. Uh, they take them with them, and so all of these undeveloped, uh, even um, like uh, you know like Ann Cobbs who lives on a forest uh, reserve. Well, a forest reserve is ripe for people you know attempting to grow. You know, Bacalolo out in those areas, and 
if they have fire ants at, on their property in that nursery, they're going to take them. Take them. Take them. Yes. Okay. I understand that, that peanut butter is the attractive and yes, the poison, and you said they take it back to the nest. Yes. Then what happens? Okay. So what happens is, uh, basically, uh, that is known as a bait poison, which means the the, the worker ants out there, um, it. Uh, consumes or you know you know saves it in the gizzard I guess maybe uh, then takes it back to the nest and distributes it as distributes uh, distributes <coughs> it as food which uh, goes to the queen and the uh, you know all the other ants and whatever and then they all die basically okay. uh, and yes. population wise from what your experience how much of it is actually destroyed well if it's an effective uh, I, I will say from my applications, uh, effective applications kills, I will say, 99% to 100% kill ratio. And we're talking about killing things, and I don't want to do that either. But mm -hmm. anyway. Um, uh, and within what period of time? Uh, overnight. Overnight? Yeah. What are the toxins that are like, what, what is the actual, like, what are, what is it? Yeah. What's the <laughs> Okay, so. I can't speak for all of them because I, I have not, you know, I, I did this like two and a half years ago, kind of researched and found what, you know, found out what I needed to find out for my own safety kind of stuff. Um, with Andrew specifically, um, and probably others, um, these, some of these poisons were uh, developed specifically for the fire ant. So they were engineered for the fire ant. Now, um, there have been, uh, I'll just speak for Amdro because I use that the most. Um, Amdro for the fire ant is a neurotoxin. Okay, so basically just kills them. Um, so you, you, you guys just believe what you want to believe and do the research that you want to re do the research. Um, but supposedly for a human to actually overdose on Amdro, you'd have to eat 400 pounds within like like an hour, something like that, uh, because of the density of the poison and the effectiveness, uh, the effect of the poison on our physical bodies. Anyway, I, res I wear a respirator when I get our client. <coughs> supposedly, supposedly, um, it is uh, a mild poison. Supposedly, if you said, believe what you want to believe, uh, Amdro itself, um, when it breaks down, it breaks down into an acid, supposedly a harmless acid that um, that is not taken up or uptaken by any root systems. The poison itself is not uptaken by any root systems, and these are like independent studies. So you guys believe what you want to believe, do the research for yourself, and come to your own conclusions. And once again, well. Do I and my family get subjected to po you know to poison or stings? And you kind of have to weigh what what you know my life. This is my life. Yes. So did you say that uh, one application of poison will kill the whole nest overnight? Uh, yes. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, 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 there's one thing, um, one powerful thing about uh, the fire ant is that each nest can have multiple queens, and I have. Myself, uh, you know the um, uh, you know the little buds um, that are do not become coconuts on coconut trees, and they're just like this big, and they just fall off, whatever like that. Um, well, when those dry out, um, it, the, the folds of of that bud basically leave spaces, and in one bud this big, I had you know broke them open, um, and I counted five queens something like this big, five queens, and maybe 500 eggs, something this big. Each fold had a queen in there. Wow. I have counted 13 queens in one nest. And I'm sure that it's, it's possible to have even more than that. And so the thing is, what, what has to be effective, what has to be effective is you get to each and every queen. <coughs> each and every queen. Um, there are other poisons. 
Dyke, uh, Dyke Mesa's earth, I'm sure, is effective in, in its way. But once again, the amount of rainfall that we get, the moisture in the air, how long does it last? I have not been or uh, done study or research on Dyke Mesa's earth, so I, I can't speak of that. Um, but it, uh, huh? it does not last if it rains. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming it's not going to be as effective. Cost well, prohibitive. Yeah, um, cost prohibitive. It's, cost it's prohibitive. about 7.30, so we'll take yeah. one or two more questions yeah, and then yes, wrap it up. What do these things eat? Everything? Grass? They eat everything? Everything. Everything. So, I mean, you can't take the food. As an, example, away, as an example, there's nothing that they don't, they, they can't, uh, or they don't um, uh, inhabit. I have a friend of mine that built a three-story house, and... Basically, it was just a shell uh, with um, with plywood and two by fours, plywood and two by fours, three stories high, and he was not he didn't have the money to finish it up, and so it just sat. The ants were all over the entire structure and the third floor, every square inch, just crawling out everywhere, just plywood and two by fours. And that's what Nothing's up there but that's just resins eating. and glues, and that's it. So everywhere, they can eat anything. Another question? You have an answer. What um, doing both Android Telstar and Telstar? Uh, uh, I'm not a person. Yeah, um, I would say Telstar is pretty intense, and I would not use it personally. There's other poisons uh, that are just as effective but less toxic, personally. Um, Anybody else that have a question? Have a question that hasn't asked uh, one. Yes. Uh, in Korea. Yes. They have uh, almost a universally uh, well recognized, uh, you know, the pesticide, natural kinds. Yeah. Of, uh, organic. Thing. Yeah. They use this uh, egg yolk. Egg yolk as a, you know, stickiness. Yes. As well as uh, nutrients. Mm -hmm. Now, they mix with the seed oil, which has a uh, anti-pest or pesticide effect. So egg yolk plus this uh, seed oil has uh, almost a universal uh, pesticide effect. Aphids, mites, all these things. I was wondering whether you have tried this egg yolk. Uh, I have never. Is, is, this, is, this is, is, a, is it one that uh, they eat and then they die, or they just walk? No, you just spray. No, no, but the, the ants. Because there's two kinds of poisons. There's well, two, two pot kinds of ways in, in which you distribute something that kills the poison, that kills the ant. Either it it uh, takes it back to the nest and the nest dies, or it kills it on contact. Yeah. yeah. You know, contact. Contact. Yeah. Contact. Yeah. Contact. Yeah. contact. Okay. This, like the dimension of the contact. Yeah. But this is. It, it helps to attach the body. Yeah. So that's the reason why you spray, you know, just like uh, that. Yeah. So they basically get stuck in it. They get stuck in it and they get stuck in it. Yeah. Okay. And so they kill it because they attach that poison. So it's a contact. Seed oil has so that's, that's another thing about the Dynatomaceous Earth. It is a contact um, poison or uh, effect. Um, and there's still that well, you're gonna basically dismantle all of those, but if you don't get to the queens, then they're gonna keep stuff. producing and producing and producing. And so you gotta make sure that right. if, if you use something, you get to the queens. Because if you don't, then you'll, you'll they'll be in your yard forever. They'll be, that nest will actually always be there producing. So what degree of control do you have now over your house? Um, 100%. 100%. Yeah. You say that with confidence. That's what I know. Yeah. How about a 63 <coughs> acre farm that had 17 acres? The 17 acres, uh, well, the, the forested uh, uh, part has not been taken down yet. So basically, what I have done uh, is surround that 17 acres. Isolated. Isolated, and I maintain the boundary. Now, what I have done. Um, and this is where I, where I say 99 to 100% uh, kill ratio, is I have taken down um, acres of, of, uh, of cane grass that were solid, you know, you know, solid fire ants, and distributed 
the Andro and the way I, in which I do it, and I have gotten. I can't say there's not fire ants because they could, they can be. But for me, going back and going back and going back, there's one acre that I have left that I did it my way uh, with Andro, and after the last a year, year and two months, I have not seen fire ants on that acre, and it was solid. So. Okay. They're just ants. They're just little insects. It's easy to kill them. It's just there's so damn many of them. You just got to get to all the queens. And if you don't get to all the queens, then you know, if, you know, three years later, you're gonna have a half acre. Have you seen any other uh, bug life on that two acres? Is there other life still there? Well, the ants themselves will basically take care of any other bug ant, bug life. With, if, with fire ants, they are tenacious, and they will rip legs off everything. Nothing survives, except yeah, for aphids. Yeah, I've seen them take out inchworms and stuff. Yeah, so, okay, this, this is the thing. You're saying what, uh, what else do they do? Um, when they inf infiltrate an entire forest, they basically they're more nocturnal. So they're, at, at night, they're even more, um, they're more active at night. What they're going to do is, here, what they're going to do is uh, affect all of the birds that we have because they're going to get into the nests and they're going to get into the birds that are just roosting for the night. Um, stories from Cass Vanderood is that he's been up in uh, Papua New Guinea where there's primitive villages, uh, hunter-gatherer villages that have never seen a white man. He was the first white man they've ever seen kind of thing. Um, they basically, these villages are packing up and leaving because they cannot handle the infestation. They don't have the technology, they don't have a way of fighting it or dealing with them because they, they just can't deal with it, so they're packing up and leaving. The hunter-gatherers, the, the hunters, um, there's miles and miles and miles and miles and miles of acres of, um, of forest that they do not go into. The reason that they, the hunters do not go into there is not because they're afraid of getting stung. There's no animals to hunt because the fire ants have taken over the forest and either killed the animals or driven them away because of irritation. This is what he's seen in person in many places. And this is how tenacious and dangerous this fire ant is. And it is on this island. We do not have the capacity to eradicate them on this island. And so they are here to, as, as, at the moment, they are here to stay and for us to deal with them. <coughs> Unfortunately, and so eventually, there's there, they. I know for a fact that they're in every single subdivision in my area, every farming area. Uh, like I said, in, in Kapoho, all the farms, permaculture, organic farms, there are probably 15 farms. Um, everybody either has them now, has had them, or we will all get them. There's no there's no stopping them. Yes, when, when you uh, use the the um, amdro and get rid of yeah. the ants. Yeah. Do other ants come back in? Other yes. insects? Yeah. Uh, well, what I, I, I classify by personally, there's uh, protein ants and there's sugar ants. And any protein ant is going to be drawn to the amdro, and the, the, the amdro is actually going to uh, uh, kill anything that eats it, right? All the ants that eat it. But then there's sugar ants. Sugar ants basically don't, don't, uh, don't want anything to do with oils and proteins and fats. Uh, I can put peanut butter on um, a, a tree and sugar ants will just do a line around it to completely avoid the peanut butter and they're going for the sweets, right? And so uh, other ants will survive and flourish, yeah, but, all, but that's all after, only after the fire ant, isn't it? Yes. So two questions. One is, so you're at the nursery and you put the peanut butter in there and you find out that there's fire ants. Yeah. You just don't buy them, right? <laughs> uh, right? Thank you, Mike. You say thank you very much. But no, thank you. Yeah. And but there's no I way would, to I would get encourage them out of you here. guys to do. Or what I would encourage you guys to do, honestly, is <coughs> get to know what a fire ant looks like uh, visually with a microscope, and so. Before, yeah, we're, when you're at the nursery, check the pot. Okay, this is where you check. Um, the fire ants basically will be on the outer rim, right, the, the top outer rim, or look at uh, on the inside where the soil level is. Look on that rim, on the inside where the soil level is. Also, there's little holes in the bottom. Check each hole and see if there's any activity going in and out. And if you have, see any ants, 
take your tape with you, whatever. Um, but if you see any ants, if you have any uh, question whatsoever, concern, this might be a fire ant, you do not want to take it home with you. Unless, you. unless you're willing to take it home and poison it as soon as you get there. Do, is there a, an elevation? Yes. Concern. What it is, is fire ants, like uh, like the cokey frogs, you know, the cokey frogs, when it's really cold at night, will just, you know, not even chirp all night long because it's too cold. Well, the fire ants also are temperature sensitive. They do not like the extreme heat of a hot day, like the full sun. That's why they're more nocturnal. But also, they don't like the cold, too cold as well. And so there is, we don't know where it is. But there is a certain elevation where the fire ants will not be above that on this island. Uh, there may be that they never get up to Wyoming. I don't know, but uh, this area, they're going to be here. They are less active if it's colder. <coughs> Some people that I know of, um, up in Hamakua, a little bit of elevation, um, they basically are inactive half the year, so they don't even have to worry about them half the year. So. What about dry visitors? Same, okay, the same thing is food and nesting sites. If dry desert is not to have as much food, it's going to have really just sparse vegetation, sparse food, sparse insects, so there's not going to be as much population. Also, yeah, like I just said, um, if it's hot desert, then they do not like that heat, the full sun heat or whatever. So everybody's going to be moving to uh, ocean. Moving up. <laughs> yes. I've been harvesting root crops with ants and aphids for 30 years. Yes. Never been bitten until last year. Okay. I was harvesting alba yeah. in Honomur about 300 feet. Okay. And I brought it up. <coughs> That's what we usually do. Whether it's kalo or ginger or whatever, we just throw the clump down, bust it up a little, and then go back to the row and do that for a while and come back. Five ten minutes later, the ants disperse, yeah. and that's it. Yeah. This time required a little, little more uh, work to get away from the ants, but we did basically the same. Yeah. But we got bit up pretty good that one clump before yeah. we realized these ants bite. I was in shock. After 30 years, I couldn't believe it. The only time I've been bitten is by the black queens with wings. The uh, regular ants, you know, the queens bite, but the workers don't. And so, can you defend against that in future root crop harvest by just disturbing them and throwing them on the side and letting them run away? No. <laughs> you just have to deal with it. You just have to well, deal with it. we'll be hand to hand. I know I'm going out of time, but uh, right. I just, once again, I know, I know, uh, to me, I know my lifestyle and my, my ideals and my values, and I myself right. have, I have looked at my own situation, and a lot of a lot of people in my neighborhood have done the same thing. People in his residences have done the same thing. What is effective, and how can I my my kids at night get not get stung all night long? So you're going to lose your organic certification. <coughs> well, I don't I don't have a certified organic. But if somebody did with an organic farm, yes, yeah, they had to not do that they would yeah. lose no, their wait. certification. No, no. Yeah. There there are possibilities. Um, Cass. Um, was working on Maui. There was an organic farm, certified organic farm, on Maui. I think it was it was a small one. It was only maybe like three acres or so um, that had fire ants. He went there in person, and the uh, the the farm owner actually allowed her farm to be given up and not be certified because she was basically she had fire ants and she was the only known um, infestation on Maui. And she looked at the greater good. Okay, well, um, if I keep my certification, I keep the fire ants, and they just keep spreading, right? And so she chose to allow them to be eradicated with, you know, more, uh, <coughs> less, less toxic poison means. Cass is um, appealing to the certification board to 
um, through her case and so what can happen and whatever like that. But that that is that is basically you know what she did, what she went through. So once you do it, if you actually get rid of them, like hopefully she's completely eradicated them. Yes. How long will it take for her? Place to come back. Well, that's that is basically dependent on the poison that they they used and what the certification board says. Okay, well now it's been long enough. Now listen, there's one thing, there's one thing um, that uh, I've been talking to Cass about is looking actually setting up a protocol for organic farms. That if an organic farm does have uh, fire ants, what do you do organically? And I, there are methods, they're very detailed and meticulous and time consuming, but there are methods that we can, I believe, because I've, I've been talking to um, Hoffa here and there, and we're going to have, hopefully, uh, a conference. Me and Cass and members of Hoffa are going to be together and look at this in a realistic way. That was so what what Hoffa says is with fire ants specifically is there's kind of like well you try the least the least invasive the least toxic thing whatever it is natural organic first then you go to the the, the next one then you go to the next one you set up your own protocol they want to see that in writing da, da, da. but what we want to do is actually set up a protocol where an organic farm can deal with fire ants before they infest the whole damn thing but. Uh, ways that are acceptable that you do not lose your certification. Yeah, um, just use the organic poison. Then you say you put organic poison in peanut butter and it just more expensive. <coughs> well, the, well, the thing is, is also though, even that poison is it legal? Is that poison legal? And right, so far, right now, th this is the hoops that we have to go through. <coughs> To jump through because a lot of a lot of things that are even certified or you know whatever are not actually able to be on the on the soil surface and so okay well it's separated what does that look like they're separate so there's so there's a difference the difference is um, how big is the infestation which means if it, is it in, um, all of it, um, your um, your avocado trees your jackfruit trees the organic poison doesn't work to a certain degree. It is, it is a certification that we're talking about right now. The, the, the organic poison does work and it is effective. It is not necessarily cost effective. Oh yeah, organic farms have to do stuff more expensive to deal with stuff like that. Yeah, so they, raise, so they raise the prices. I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> I just mean you're saying like the organic poison is just as effective, it's just more expensive. Yeah. So if you're trying to set up a method for organic farmers to not lose the certification, you just have to use the more expensive poison that's organic. Yeah, but we have to pro set up a protocol for that, right. for the usage of it. And you can't just say, well, I did this, because you, there's, you have to jump through the hoops of yeah. progression to get to, okay, this is acceptable. Now you can do this kind of thing. It's not like... Uh, right now, it's not like, uh, well, I got a fire ants, and I'm just going to do this. Um, Hoffa wants to see a progressive um, methodology of how did you, you, well, why didn't you try this first, and why didn't you try this, and why didn't you try this? This is the most most toxic organic, whatever the hell that is, but um, it's not necessarily acceptable. Um, so anyway, so it, there's there's a lot of very a lot of variables, and so. For an organic farmer, a lot of them are not making a lot of money, and so it's like, well, yeah, I can take care of the fire ants, but it cost you fifty thousand dollars. What if you don't yeah. have fifty thousand dollars? What are you going to do? Yeah, what? Um, I was just realizing this is pretty of problems that we have with everything going on with strawberry guava and everything that it comes yeah. in invasively. That people say the only solution is to put poison on it because it's yeah. such a huge problem. And, yeah. and we're really dealing with petroleum-based products that are a finite resource. And so, yeah, right now, in this moment, it works. But you're talking about 10-year, 20-year yeah. problem. We don't know if boats keep coming in. We don't know. You know, it's $4 well, a it gallon right now. Yeah, the blue fire <laughs> is just uh, the new one. You know, yeah. we, we have so many. Yeah. So I think it would be helpful to know that, that we're working within our resources on the island. Like, talking about a fungus or talking about something that, that grows here that can help people work with their land and know that we 
we can do it if we were cut off, or, you know, because it's a temporary solution for something that's on a much larger scale, but a really big deal. So I just, I hope that there is more research besides just like spray poison. Unfortunately, the money is, you know, commercial poisoning. And so for, for someone to actually be able to have the time and, and the, I don't know, the, the, the capacity to do the research, um, use the technologies and this and that and this and that, um, right now all the money is going into what's cheap and available and they can put it on a, a grocery store shelf. And but but you know the thing is they're not going anywhere. So we've got the rest of our lives to find out what works on little fire is because they're not going away and if we're not going away we will find that. Well, I think more than just the fire so it's like it's the mentality of like the yeah. cheap, the quick, the easy and in the long run that's the whole mentality of our agricultural system. It would be yeah. really good to, to start seeing more support for people to find what is in our community, what's on our land, what we have available to us right here and now to fight, or I don't even like the word fight, but to work with. Yeah, it, it, it's, basic, we don't want it to be a war. Yeah. The thing, and like I said, the thing is, um, there also is just the in the moment, the daily life of my kids getting stung every night. And so, so people have to, like I said, make, make those uh, judgment calls and weigh those options. Um, what do I do right now? What do I do tonight to protect my own kids, uh, to protect my own self, to be able to harvest fruit from my own orchard without um, you know, endangering my life? A lot, some people uh, with just one sting will you know, go into shock and they just like people are uh, allergic to bee stings, some people are also allergic to fire ant stings. Actually, uh, ants and bees are in the same family, in the same phylum or whatever. But anyway, um, some people have, uh, you know, major reactions to just one sting. So, anyway, did you want to say one more thing? Uh, no, that was that. Okay, all right. I think I'm my time. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. Appreciate it.